So we're going to continue um, venturing into a series that's going to be lasting for a number of months um, from the book of John through the book of Acts. We're going to be covering both of those books in sequence. And um, this morning we come to uh, a miracle. We're going to talk about Jesus' first public miracle of his public ministry. No, of the 35 recorded miracles that Jesus performed, the book of John actually only tells us about eight of those miracles. And, and, and John chose to write concerning these miracles because they specifically showed the power of Christ's word. And the first miracle recorded by John, which, with, which is what I'm going to be speaking with you about today, is not found in any other of the gospel accounts. But it is the first miracle that Jesus performed that was semi-public. The reason I say semi is because it was in a closed group scenario. Um, he performed it before a select number of individuals, including his mother, his disciples, several servants, and a family that was in desperate need of intervention. So, if you've got a Bible with you, if you'd like to turn with me to buy in your Bible to John chapter 2, we're going to be starting our reading in verses 1 and 2 of John chapter 2. John chapter 2, verse 1, says this, On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. Okay, so leading up to this wedding, Jesus had just been publicly revealed by John the Baptist as God's Messiah. And in chapter 1, we see very clearly how the Apostle John lays out the identity of Jesus Christ, very clearly. And after three days, Based upon the fact that Jesus' mother was at this wedding, the disciples were invited to attend. And, and we're, we're assuming that this wedding involved um, very close friends of, of Mary. Um, but the fact that, that both Jesus and his disciples were invited suggests that it was likely um, a wedding involving one of Jesus' relatives, one of his relatives. So the wedding festivities in the context of first century Israel, a little bit different than how we celebrate weddings. Um, th those weddings actually uh, happened, and then there was a great feast, and, and the celebration of a wedding took place uh, around a five days to a week of celebration. And during the celebration, the parents of the groom, unlike today where the bride's parents in our culture, um, threw a banquet, okay? The parents... Uh, the parents, well, I guess maybe not all the time, but anyway. There was a large wedding feast that occurred with the Jewish wedding, and it, and it was customary for um, the Jewish wedding feast to accompany a larger group of people than actually were part of the ceremony. Much larger. It was a great celebration that was put on by the groom's family. And it was very important in this culture to supply enough food and drink for the banquet during the celebration. It was a joyful time. And, and to run out of food or, or to run out of wine or drink at this banquet that was thrown would be a very, very embarrassing situation for the entire family of the groom. It would be shameful. As the banquet was a statement that the family of the groom gave to the family of the bride saying, that they were going to take care of their daughter. She was going to be well looked after. So it was, it was more than just a supper. It was a statement. Well, as it goes, we see, something happened, and, and the family of the groom somehow misjudged the amount of wine that was going to be needed to supply the banquet, and the wine ran out. And this caused, this caused more than a little bit of concern for the groom's family. And as a matter of fact, Mary, Jesus' mother, was aware of the circumstances that was shared with her. And she appealed to Jesus for help. 
So we continue reading from verse 3, and we, we read this. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. Woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. So as you can imagine, this was an urgent circumstance. And the request of Mary appears to be um, very concerned for the reputation of the groom's family. This is a big deal. And running out of wine um, could shame the couple that was getting married for an awfully long time. And, and, And Jesus replied to Mary, when you read that, okay, when she advised him that the wine had run out, uh, to us, okay, when we, when we read that, it almost sounds like a rebuke, doesn't it? Almost sounds like a rebuke. Um, you know, in English, addressing anyone, your mother or your wife, as woman, right? Instead of mother, sounds disrespectful. But I think Jesus' intention here was, was not disrespectful. Now, bear in mind, this is written in Greek, and we are reading it in English, so we carry all our cultural understandings of things with it. I, I, I think Jesus calling Mary woman was, was actually endearing. It wasn't just simply uh, a rebuke. It was, an, it was endearment, but it was very important for her to understand something. It was, it was made for emphasis, but not for not in a derogatory form or respectful ma- manner as if, you know, like in our culture, someone would say, woman, where's my dinner? Or woman, fetch me my slippers, right? That, those are reasons for many marital split-ups when you have that kind of dynamic taking place in a relationship, right? But I don't think that was what was going on here in this family. And, you know, I, I think Jesus, Jesus' words, my hour has not yet come indicate, and he wanted Mary to be crystal clear, that he had a divine schedule that he was managing the pace of, and that schedule would, at the perfect timing, show the people who he really was. So, now perhaps, I mean, when you're thinking of this through Mary's eyes, I, I just started thinking about this, like, what was Mary thinking? Like, what, how was she thinking about this? She brought her observations of the problem to Jesus because she anticipated. I'm sure, Mary, can you imagine, right? As a young lady, you're visited by the angel Gabriel and you're told that you're going to be, the, you're gonna be the, the, the mother, the vehicle by which God sends his Messiah into the world. And in the Jewish mind, there's no, there no misunderstanding about this. The Messiah was not just some good person. The Messiah was God in the flesh. So can you imagine being Mary at that time? Right? Mary knew that her son was God the Son. She knew that she had been with no man and that what was birthed in her was of the Holy Spirit. She knew her pregnancy was not natural. It was supernatural. And you see, the problem is, is she, was, she had a supernatural thing happen to her in a natural world. So can you imagine the people that would be thinking or talking? I mean, there would have been like, oh, she's pregnant. I mean, Joseph did an honorable thing and, and the angel visited him. The Lord's angel visited him too and, and said, hey, what's happened here is my plan. I've, she's my chosen vehicle. Because Jesus had to be born without sin. So there couldn't have been a human father involved in this. So this was a miracle. This incarnation, we call it, kids. If you ever hear that word incarnation, that's the fact that God came down to the world and was born as a man, miraculously. So it's hard to know what Mary was thinking, really, with this scenario. Raising Jesus, knowing he's the Messiah... I'm sure, you know, Jesus, throughout his childhood, there's a few glimpses of it. We see him in the temple showing great wisdom and everything. But Mary was probably thinking to herself, I wonder when he's going to take the stage. When is he going to show these people who he is? When is he going to show these people that he's the Savior? 
that he created the universe. Yes, my son created the universe. Wow. What a special knowledge she would have had in her heart to know this. Nevertheless, Mary suggested that Jesus do something at this wedding, and, and she likely wanted to see a, a public miracle that everyone could understand all the stories that she said. And I'm sure she tried to explain this to her family. And like we, we see until later, Jesus' brothers didn't even believe. Until later, when they began to see his public ministry unfold. I think Jesus was, he didn't say this. He didn't say, Mary, I won't perform this miracle. It's not my time. It's not, that's not what he said. And in fact, what, what he was saying to her, I think, was something like this, like, don't worry. You don't quite understand what is going on. You just need to leave things to me, mother. My dear mother. And I will settle them in my own way. That's kind of what his, I think his spirit was, was saying here. So with this in mind, when Mary told the servants at the banquet to do what Jesus said, she understood that he was not refusing to help, so she seriously believed that he was going to perform a miracle, but he was going to do it in a way that he thought best. And how that was going to unfold, that was up to Jesus. So we see in verse 6, nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to his servants, fill the jars to the, with water. So they filled them to the brim. Now these jars were nearby, and, and there could have been other jars in this house because everything in that day was, was handmade by someone. So there was likely clay pots and clay jars that were used for common purpose in this house. But God saw fit that the jars that Jesus was going to use for this miracle were jars that were used for religious ceremonial cleansing. You see, the Jews, the Jews, according to the law of Moses and according to their traditions through, uh, through the teachers of the law, they also had a, a book that expressed the traditions as well. There was different traditions, and they followed many ritual purity laws for a variety of reasons, you know, like, for instance, if they touched a dead person or something like that, or something to be deemed unclean, they would have to go through a ceremony to cleanse themselves in a ceremony with pure spring water, also called living water, water that had come from a running source. So the pure water that they used for ritual cleansing was always stored in stone jars. They didn't have Tupperware. They didn't have rain barrels made out of PVC or whatever. They didn't have that. And, and, and according to the Jewish mindset and according to the law of Moses, um, the jars could not be made from clay because clay, clay was deemed to be an unclean material for ritual cleansing purposes. Because there is always a potential for something to be in that clay that would biologically contaminate the jars. Jars made from soil were not acceptable vessels for ceremonial washing. No, the ritual jars were carved out of stone, and the stone was, was, was thought to be, well, was presented as a material that was clean. It wouldn't be something that could contaminate this living, pure spring water. Okay. According to archaeological finds, we have actually know about this because they actually uncovered uh, a house that had, uh, had been burned up, but everything had been collapsed upon it, and they actually found these types of jars in the same areas where this miracle occurred. In ancient Jerusalem and Cana, the, these jars were found to be carved out of a very soft kind of limestone that was found in the area. So... But anyways, enough about jars and, and limestone. The reason I'm explaining to you this 
is there, there's something very specific that God wanted to send a message for in this particular miracle. You see, Jesus' miracle involved the vessels used to store pure water for ritual purification washing. And the servants, they were instructed to fill these jars, and they filled it right to the brims. No one could say that some strong wine had been added in on top of the water. No, these jars were filled to the brim with spring water. Or could have been from any number of sources. But then he, then he told them in verse 8, Now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so. And the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. This is significant. This is significant. This whole thing right here. I mean, if you read this just peripherally, oh yeah, Jesus changed the water into wine. That's cool. That's a really cool miracle. Yes, it is a very cool miracle. It is very cool, but it's significant that the water for ritual purification would be used to cleanse the outside of the person to make them temporarily holy before God. And the primary purpose of these washing rituals was to show a heart that was subservient to the Lord, that you were desiring to be spiritually clean or holy. And this would happen as a, as, as a ritual in physical cleansing. Okay, But here Jesus took this water used to ceremonial clean the outside of a person and he changed it into wine that would be taken into a person blessing that person satisfying that person and cleansing them it was like a precursor to what he would do later and cleansing them on the inside ceremonially cleansing does this ring a bell to any of you guys Think about communion for a little bit as we're talking here. Okay? See, Jesus, the interference that is beyond the obvious miracle of turning water into wine, I mean, that authenticated Jesus as God's Messiah. It did. It really did. And it spoke volumes to the, pe- to the people who saw it happen. The message of the ceremonial cleansing water being turned into wine that was consumed is that Jesus is making a statement about a coming new covenant in his blood that would be given to cleanse people not just ritually on the outside but to cleanse them on the inside to fill them and satisfy their spiritual thirst. Do you see the depth that this takes? It takes a turn and goes, whew. Sometimes I'm amazed about the Bible and, and, and the way that God unfolds it. And you can read the same story a dozen times and every time you read it, there's something new. There's something more interesting that God kind of reveals to you about his character and his person. See, I believe there's a very strong connection here between the drinking of the wine that Jesus gave them at the wedding and the wine taken as a representative of his blood at the Last Supper. You see, Jesus was publicly proclaimed by John the Baptist to be the Messiah three days before, and then all of a sudden, this wine that the people consumed three days later was, was life-giving to their, their circumstance. You see, you, see the, you see the correlation? See, at the Last Supper during the Passover feast, okay, and we, for, for kids, you guys, the Passover is when, when God delivered his people out of Egypt, Right? Pharaoh wouldn't let him go. He refused to let him go. He had a hardened heart. He wouldn't let them go. And God performed a miracle to let Israel go. Because So anyways, what happened was there was a, an angel of death that was sent upon Egypt as a judgment by God. And, 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 and this angel um, would take the life of the firstborn male of every household except for those people who had the blood of the Lamb They'd sacrifice a lamb and they put the blood over the doorposts of their house so that when the death angel came over Egypt, he would look at their house and would pass over it because of the sacrificial Passover lamb, that the blood that had taken the place of the people inside. So you see, Jesus, 
was our Passover lamb. We deserve the wrath of God. Do you understand? All of us are sinners. Not a single person here can say that I'm righteous enough. You can't earn your way to God. You can't make it so that you're good enough to be acceptable in God's sight. You can't do it because it's not within you. You have a nature within you that is sinful. And the wrath of God against sin must be carried out. But God in His mercy, He loved people so much that He Himself came to earth and made Himself the Passover sacrifice so that you wouldn't have to die, so that His blood could be applied to the doorposts of your heart. So when the angel of death comes to take people, He will pass over you and you will have life and freedom instead of death and wrath. Uh, Mark 14, 26, or 23 to 26 says this. We understand. Right before Jesus was crucified on the Passover, he took the cup. Then he took the cup. This is communion, kids. We're talking about. Then he took the cup. He gave thanks and offered it to them. And they all drank from it. This is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many, he said to them. I tell you the truth that I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it anew in the kingdom of God. And when they had sung a hymn, they all went to the Mount of Olives. And Paul the Apostle says that we do this as a church as often as we do it in remembrance of what Jesus did. So the wine that's taken in communion, the fruit of the vine that's taken in communion, is symbolic of the work of Christ and the inner person washing away our sin, cleansing us. You see the ritual cleansing ceremony of these jars, these holy jars? And Jesus takes, it, takes the water of a, of, of a tradition and a, an outward ceremony and he internalizes it by, by, by providing a view into where he was going to take people in the very near future. And this was his first public miracle. So this is the launching point. Three days after he was proclaimed by John to be the Messiah. So the wine which represents the atonement. Atonement means at one with God. People are separated from God by their sins. As a sinner, you're separated by God, from God by your sins. Atonement means God bringing us together at one with him. Atonement, at one -ment. See, the wine which represented the atonement on the cross through the blood of Jesus was clearly used to foreshadow the death of Jesus on the cross during the Last Supper and then commemorated by drinking of the fruit of the vine represented of the blood of Jesus cleansing power during the Lord's Supper in our church communion services until the Lord returns. But the wine that Jesus had created to be served to the people at the wedding feast, it wasn't just passable as wine. No. It was not watered down. It wasn't poor quality wine. It was the very best that could be given. It was the very best quality wine. In Jewish feasts, someone was designated to be the banquet master and they were accustomed to seeing people being served uh, the high quality wine in small portions at first and then to save money, the family would get cheaper wine and would serve the, re the, the, the cheaper wine to them after everyone had started drinking the wine. Right? That, was, that was the way it was. But the person responsible for the, the feast, they were responsible in the Jewish uh, uh, wedding to make sure that the guests were taken care of and that the feast ran smoothly. The banquet master didn't know that he was drinking from water that had been filled into purification jars. He had no idea. So when he said in verse 9b of our, of our text, you can imagine the context of this, right? He didn't know. Then he called the bridegroom aside and he said, everyone brings out the choice wine first and then the cheaper wine after the guests had had too much to drink. But you have saved the best until now. See, what Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. Yes, this was a twofold message. His disciples believed in him. It was at a village wedding feast 
in an obscure little Galilean village that Jesus first showed his glory. (laughs) The significance of this miracle can't be understated. The best wine was served last, and it came from pure water that God himself transformed into high-quality wine. You see, what Jesus would begin in a new covenant through his blood was a significant advance over what had been done ceremonially on the outside through Judaism and the observances of the law of Moses. It was the fulfillment of the law. Everything in the Old Testament points to the cross. Everything in the New Testament points back to the cross. The centerpiece of this is the cross, friends. The centerpiece is the cross. Jesus, you see, <laughs> said this. He said in, first, in 2 Corinthians um, 5, 17, through his apostle, the apostle Paul, he said, Therefore, is anyone, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. Paul was inspired by the Holy Spirit to say this. Friends, if you come to a saving relationship with Jesus Christ, you are a new creation in Him. The old has gone and the new has come. This is exciting. And here at the wedding in Cana, the disciples' faith was reinforced with a dazzling glimpse of who Jesus Christ really was in, in, in His person. And after this, He went down, it says in verse 12, to Capernaum with his mother and brothers and his disciples where they stayed for a few days. So, wrapping this up. See, Jesus met the needs of this family at a wedding, at a celebration that was, the rain was going to fall on the parade here, right? He was, he did this to show that he can help people overcome impossible difficulties and bring joy even though In ourselves, we have gone barren. This miracle shows how God's abundance is brought into our lives. Jesus is the figurehead that shows this. This miracle shows how God um, has given Jesus to become all we really need to fill the void. And Jesus, Jesus, when the Bible is talking about um, wine, okay? It symbolizes life and, and, and vitality and joy and blessing and prosperity. Yes, the abuse of wine is drunkenness and the Bible condemns it. It says, do not be drunk on wine, right? Which leads to debauchery. But instead, be filled with the Spirit, right? But, but you know, Psalm 104, 14 and 15, King David says, he makes grass to grow for the cattle, and plants to grow for people, for people to cultivate. Plants for people to cultivate. Bring forth food from the earth. Wine that gladdens human hearts. Oil to make their faces shine. And bread that sustains their hearts. So, so the Old Testament gives a picture of wine of this. But in the New Testament, the wine also represents the blood of Christ. Changing water meant for purification into wine. Symbolic of blood, of the blood, is reference to Jesus' role as our Savior and Messiah. Instead of purification rituals like we see in the Old Testament, we're purified by the miraculous cleansing power of the blood of Jesus Christ applied to the doorposts of our hearts. See, Jesus Jesus offers us something greater than wine. He offers himself a new covenant in his blood. Jesus, Jesus is the true vine. And, and we are the branches. Just Jesus is the vine, the source of life and joy for, for whoever comes to him and believes that he is God in the flesh. We'll be connected to him and we'll grow and we'll be fed by the nourishing sap from the vine. See, Jesus was driven by his Father's plan. He had a plan, not just simply to solve the problem. We see, read it this, sometimes in Sunday school we read the miracle and we just take it at face value. Well, yes, Jesus was wanting to help at this feast and wanted to show people uh, uh, goodness and grace, but there was more to it. It's deeper. You see, he wasn't simply there to solve the problem at a wedding feast that was lacking wine. 
He, he was to solve the deep... He was, he was giving a miracle to show that He can solve the deepest problems we face. The problem of sin. Like the family who had run out of wine at their banquet needing a miracle when we come to Jesus Christ and we ask Him to come into our world. We come to Him in need, in great need of salvation. Jesus came into a spiritually empty world in need to be rescued from themselves. The Bible tells us the penalty of sin is death. And the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. And because we're all sinners, we deserve this penalty of death that has been given, has been mandated. God is holy, and no one can come into His presence unless the sin issue is taken care of. See, Jesus, Jesus came to us and gave His holy, pure life in exchange for our sinful life. As we remember the sacrificial work of Jesus by taking the fruit of the vine on communion Sundays at the communion table, we remember that Jesus' blood applied to the sinner's heart. Jesus' blood, my friend, can save the soul, heal the sick, mend the heart. Jesus' blood applied gives us very access to the throne room of God. You don't want to walk alone. You walk at one with your God, with your Creator. This is what atonement is all about. This is why Jesus had to die because He wanted us to receive atonement and be brought back close to Him because He loves us so much. He created us. God created us as an inheritance for Him so that in eternity He could live with His inheritance forever in the saints, forever and ever and ever. His blood applied to your heart can change you, can make the old you new. He was shed for you. The blood of God's pure, holy, sacrificial lamb. You know, I was thinking about, how am I going to end this? How am I going to end this message? Friends, this is, this is the day of salvation. If you're here today and you're not right with God, God's calling you. And no, He's a gentleman. He's not going to force you to do something you won't want to do. But the Holy Spirit calls out to you today to surrender your life to the life-giving work of Jesus Christ so that you can be at one with your, your Creator, so you can have you can be born in the Spirit even though your sins are like scarlet. He can wash them clean as white as the freshly fallen snow. I was thinking, how can I bring this home to everyone? When I was a young man, I was thinking about youth convention and all this. When I was a young man, there's this guy named Carmen. He, he, used to, he used to sing some fairly, well, at that time they were, you know, fresh and new songs that he'd sing and, and, and really impactful. This one song had an imprint on me. I'm going to leave you with this song tonight, or this morning. I'm going to ask this. That when we play this song, you think about what Jesus did for you. You think about what he's done for you. His blood was shed for you. And today, if you don't know Christ, you can come to know him. You can surrender your heart to the living God, and he will fill you with the living water the wine of His blood. He can wash you clean in the wine of His blood. I know blood is a touchy thing. People go, Ugh. Yes, it is. Ugh. But what Christ did for you was He took a horrible death and a horrible penalty as the Creator so that you could experience life. Amen. So after this song, if you want to come for it, if you've never received Jesus as your Savior, I'm going to invite you to come up and we'll pray for you. And if you're here today and you've been broken, Jesus has answers. Cast your cares upon Him. It's not going to be a cloud dance all the time. You're going to be in the valley sometimes and it's going to be tough. But God is with you no matter where you are in your life right now. He's with you. Amen. Let's uh, play that. And if I could get uh, some other turn. You know, 
as a pastor, it's the longing of my heart to see people understand who God is. I know that I'm just a human being and really just a bread distributor of the bread of life that God's given to me. And you are too. If you've come to know Christ, God longs to work in and through you. So I think today, if we could just close in a song that uh, I think we just turn our focus towards the Lord Jesus. And As I said before, if you're here and, and you've never come to know Jesus as your Savior, today could be the day of the first day of the rest of your life. Because without Christ, your spirit is dead because of sin. But you can become alive in Him today. So, if you want to come for prayer, as we're singing this, come on up. Don't be shy. This is, every one of us has to come to a statement in our life where we decide what we're going to do with the Lamb of God, what we're going to do with Jesus. And today is it may be your day. So, we're just going to sing that song, Blessed Be the Lord Our God, God Almighty. And if you want to stand um, with us today, we'll, we'll sing this. It's an older song that many of you know from passing.